Okay, so um, let's get, let's get to it. Um, so about today's speakers, I'm really excited about um, um, uh, having Stuart, you know, on on today to be able to do this. Uh, you know, Stuart, um, uh, um, co-founder of RMS, uh, founded in 19, 1998. Uh, you know, 25 years. So he's he's a industry vet, veteran. Um, you know, has a lot of knowledge, not just within motion amplification, which was he was a very early adopter of the technology, but just in CBM. You know, in reliability in general. And uh, you know, I don't know if you can see behind him there on the wall. He's got a pretty big fish. So you know, that's uh, um, that that is not an optical illusion. That fish is really that big. <laughs> so he is an avid fisherman. If you don't know, he's got a he's got a YouTube channel that he does. That actually gets quite a few views on on some of his pitching adventures. I think you've uh, yeah. you're I think you mentioned you've got one coming up uh, here pretty soon yeah. too. And so yeah. And and then finally, I've got you know he's an MA rock star. So if you've ever seen his <laughs> videos, you know <laughs> they're good. And and he really yeah. knows how to use this technology, and he really knows how to make it shine. Um, you know, I haven't seen him since COVID, but I, probably the next time I get to see him in person. I probably need to get his autograph when when when, when I'm <laughs> yeah. there. So um, so anyway, uh, you're you're in for a treat. But um, um, but anyway, I'll let I'll let Stuart maybe you know uh, yeah. you know if you want to give a little background about yourself as yeah, well. No yeah, no worries. Yeah, yeah. So like Jeff says, I've been uh, been involved with CB and reliability for the last 25 years. And uh, for me, when uh, I first saw the motion amplification technology, I would, honestly I was I was quite skeptical. Um, it was one of those that almost looked too good to be true, uh, but um, I had to, I used the kit on a resonance problem and visualized this lovely vacuum pump that I knew was the way it was moving, and the camera just nailed it within a few minutes. And ever since then, I've, I've just been a real uh, fan of the technology. It's just made my job easier. The customers love it for communication. So hopefully, some of these. Uh, examples we'll go through um, should uh, strike home with everyone. Cool. Cool. Yeah. And, you know, for those of you who don't know, you know, I, I kind of approach this from a little bit different path, you know, in physics and, and then, you know, com you know, started, started RDI to kind of get this technology out. So, um, you know, I come at it from a little bit of different angle, but it's uh, a lot of the same problems and, you know, um, with, mm -hmm. with just using cameras for, for, for solving vibration problems. Um, so we have um, a saying now, Jeff. Sorry, we we have a saying now with the lads with the cameras. We we say, uh, just get the camera on it. <laughs> yeah, that's that that's right. Yeah, yeah. If, if if it moves, we'll we'll see it. You know, sort of thing. Yeah. Um, um, okay, well, cool. Let's go ahead and um, let's go ahead and get going. So I've got a, a few slides on just kind of what is motion amplification. So we inevitably, you know, there's always people who are, get, get in webinars and don't understand, you know, what the technology is, they're new to it. So just a little bit about that, you know, we're really using cameras to measure vibration. You can measure anywhere in the image, you know, as you'll see through these, but but once we can, you know, use the individual pixels as displacement sensors, you can actually make the motion bigger and um, actually see it in the video. Uh, normal video wouldn't capture that. And you can see anything from, you know, lower frequency stuff even higher frequency things too, just used by using a high speed camera. Uh, this is, I think, over a thousand. This is around 11, 1100 um, hertz. So, but maybe a little bit more applicable to our industry would be something like this. Whereas, you know, it may take an, an analyst a few hours to be able to see that, but um, to be able to figure out maybe if there's, there's looseness there. But with emotion amplification, you're minutes in before you can get this sort of video. And we'll talk all about how, you know, you get this kind of shot set up. But it kind of goes beyond just um, just the typical kind of vibration, um, but you can also track and measure dynamic vibration as it moves through the scene. So, um, like in this in in this case here, where we're actually tracking something and measuring um, the vibration as it moves, and so you can see when it deviates from the path that it's supposed to be taking, uh, that sort of thing. Um, but you know, we're really again we're leveraging the camera to measure things that aren't visible by the eye. Um, and uh, the idea is, you know, what once was maybe the story had to be told by that spectrum that you're seeing now can be told by a video. And that story is not necessarily communicating to maybe someone who's not technical, but it's really the understanding for the technician themselves or the, the analyst themselves, because the, the amount of information that you get back is really unparalleled with, with a camera. And so um, now you can visualize this 
and, and quantify and, and understand not just the vibration, but the context of the vibration. It sort of turns things on its head, as you'll, as you'll see. Um, you know, and, and in terms of scalability, too, if you start to think about a camera, a pixel being a sensor, right? So you think of it being just a displacement sensor. Now you're talking about one, two, ten, 10, 100, a million, you know, 2 million data points that you're measuring simultaneously. So, you know, you can scale up data collection and do what we call full field vibration, where you're measuring everything um, across, the, across the field of view. And so um, it gets pretty interesting when, when you can do that, you start to learn a lot a lot more things and see new things that you've never seen before. And we'll, we'll sort of get to that a little bit too. Um, for those of you who are wondering about maybe it's the technical specifications, you know, you can kind of read that. I'll highlight a few of these things, but um, you know, fundamentally we're measuring displacement. Um, you know, we can do this live, which we'll, we'll, we'll demonstrate. Um, we'll, we'll kind of talk through, Stuart, we'll talk through these these, these examples, and we'll talk about them and also kind of supplement that with some demonstration of the software. Uh, but you can see down to small motions that, you know, 0 0.01 mils or less than a micron and see, you know, amplify up to 500 times. And, and, um, and, and what's interesting too is it goes beyond just the typical vibration single point reading, which we can do anywhere in the scene, but you can also do things like measure shaft displacement because it's non-contact or measure torsional with these, um, with these new um, with these new features that we've we've developed with the camera, so um, finally the last slide in the intro I just want to show here is just kind of the picture of what we're looking at. You know, um, you can do this anywhere from a point in time troubleshooting, which you see on the left, the Iris M. You can supplement that with high speed camera if you need to capture faster events. You can move to an MX camera, or you can do continuous monitoring with the Iris CM. You know, so you have this variety of options that you can kind of expand, you know, across with um, with troubleshooting to continuous monitoring, just depending on what what problem you're trying to solve. So with that, we'll go ahead and we'll jump straight in in into the case studies and um, you know start talking about motion amplification. So yeah, if you just want to play this one, Jeff, and we'll have a chat about it. So this is a pump um, had a um, high one times on the pump. And um, we knew it was sort of in a resonance problem, but we wanted to sort of visualize the machine. And what I want to get across here for people that maybe use the technology is, is basically moving around the, the asset really, and actually documenting the different parts of the machine. So don't just sit in one place with a tripod because it's not like a vibration analyzer that's got a route built in saying, go to this point, go to that point. It's down to you where you go. And what I would say is document the whole machine. And as you can see here, we're focusing in on the, the feet of the pump. And we see two things there, the bed's flexing, but also it looks like there's a loose bolt on the rear of the pump. So then what we'll do, we'll uh, probably change lens, uh, put a 25 millimeter lens on uh, and actually get a little bit closer. And here we are, we're looking at the foot now. But unbelievably, you can actually see there's a little crack there that the camera's highlighted. And um, when we was with on this machine, I had the engineer with me and I'm saying there's a crack there and he's like scraping away the dirt, is there? And yeah, the camera's just brilliant for that. So these little subtleties, you've got to get in there and these are some of, it's not the best pump base, this one, is it? But uh, we're getting around the back of the machine now and we're documenting each foot. And you can see, even though you think something's tight or bolted down, the camera's clearly showing um, that one's obviously loose. Um, very poor base on that one, needs a lot of work. So the, the theme with that was sort of move around the asset. That's, that's the point I'm uh, trying to get across because it's, I know a lot of people who do a lot of training with a camera and everyone seems to like get concreted to one spot and you've got to move, you've got to move with this camera. I always think sometimes it's like teaching people to dance and, and, and when you're yeah. there, like they don't want to pick their feet up, you know, they want to kind yeah. of sway their body, but you know, you got to get them, you know, moving their feet and moving around, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of a similar, similar approach. Um, yeah. You shot this one pretty early, right? I mean, this was one of the early shots that you guys did. Do, do you know what, Jeff? I, th I think this was this was me and Keith's first one. We really like we lit it up and we like got in there. 
and it was it was just a great example to start with and yeah you can see the base as well it's just it's just flexing the it needs um totally new base and some extra supports to change the natural frequency of the pipe work and you know when i first saw this video one of the things that i took away from it is like it, it, a couple of things but one of the things that i thought is really interesting about this is how you know the first shot you know you took that mm. shot which i think is really important and and you you mm. really emphasize that taking that holistic shot where you see everything right and yeah. and it's almost like the asset itself you know if you look at the video because you know you can analyze this in the field and you can look mm. right there it, it sort of guided you to to the spot because you could see the motion and and it, yeah. and it really led you to the next spot that you needed to take and i, yeah. I think that happens a lot uh, yeah. Um, yeah. if people just survey the data yeah, it's so important when you do the shot to make sure you've got the bottom of the concrete bedding, the feet. If you sort of miss a connection, you might be missing an actual problem. So, Yeah, because a shot like this, and this is one of the things that I always want people to, to remember is that, you know, when you're, you're, you've got, you're out there, you're, you're set up, you're collecting the data, you know, it literally takes you five extra seconds to take mm -hmm. that extra wide angle shot, you know, and yeah. it's not really one that you want to, you want to miss. The, the yeah. other thing that too about this data set that I think is really interesting is, is the idea on um, with motion amplification, I think people need to remember is, you know, all the way from big to small, you can see this big, you know, sort of mm. view, um, but mm. also, but really down to the crack level where it's just a single pixel. You're not, you know, because the cameras, you know, yeah. you know, have those sensors that are butted up right up against each other. You're getting that mm. continuous coverage. And if a crack is even a pixel wide, the camera's still going to pick it up. Yeah. They almost flash, don't they? The uh, yeah. crack because of the light. It's really, really good. Yeah, like here, there it is. You know, you can actually see that, and that's that's not a that's about a pixel wide, you know. Mm. And it's uh, but but no stern gets unturned, you know, left unturned, you know, with the camera because yeah. of that. Yeah. So cool. Yeah, we'll go on to the next one, Jeff. We'll have a look. So, so the next one, <coughs> I think. Uh, I get often asked, how do we know when to get the camera out? And this is a classic example. It's a cleaning, it's a sugar plant, it's, it's a shaker screen and it cleans the sugar beet, gets the, washes the dirt off the uh, product. And um, is that plain, Jeff? Oh yeah. Yeah, I, I move the, anytime I move yeah. the chat up, it, it pauses the video, so yeah. So this motor on top, this is the trend, the overall trend, uh, which went up to 50 millimeters per second uh, that prompted really to get the camera out. So once we've got this high, um, could you jump it back, Jeff? Sorry. Yeah, and I, just real quick, I got to ask you, when you see things like this, just out of curiosity, because it happens to me, do you still get like this look of kind of like, that's crazy? Yeah, we, <laughs> it's very really true. We get all giddy. We get all giddy when we see, look at that. Look, look at those struts and... Uh, yeah, we're doing this job with Keith, actually, and he spotted those and says, they don't look right. But uh, you, you want me to go back to the beginning? Or? Yeah, to the trend. Yeah, to the trend, yeah. Yeah, so it's about incorporating your routine VA routes. And, and this was a great one. You can see we've got a slightly erratic trend. That's what it does. But then it jumped up and it's like, right, the frequency was at the frequency of the screen. So we got the camera, we're 25 meters away here. Uh, we're getting a real wide shot and we're looking for anything out of the ordinary. And yeah, there's quite a lot of movement and those vertical struts, uh, you can see some at the front, they're rock steady. So we were not, not happy with those at all. And then it, it start moving to the motion again, getting in there, getting closer. There's another shot just at the connection. Wow. And see the the vertical strut just on that left hand side is a lot of motion there uh, and this this is a filtered video so what we do we get the frequency of the uh, screen i think it it's something about 800 cpm i think something like that so these are the struts looking there and although there's a lot of product uh, chopped bits of sugar beet i can see there this severe movement on these so i didn't even need to get a spade and start digging these out. I knew that these struts had failed. Um, so what we did, the guys, they got in there while it was still running, did a bit of a temporary repair, 
added a bit of a brace. And as you can see there, the aftershot uh, and the levels have come right back down, down to 12, which for this machine is acceptable. So again, I'll start that one over, yeah, just so they can see the what yeah, the, the no before, yeah. Yeah, so in this, I mean, this is a complicated structure. There's little beams everywhere and trying to go around with a, a sensor to suss what's happening is just, it's impossible. But you get the camera and you, you're there five minutes and you, boom, look at those struts. And they're even behind a safety guard as well, like to be fair. So. Yeah, it's it's interesting because in situations like this, you know, this I think that it yeah, it's a hard problem to tackle. Uh, mm. You know, and and it's and, and it's kind of like what sensors do you use? Um, and and I think it's a good point. You know, to in these complex fields, it's still and and we'll talk about this in the next one. But there's mm. other techniques like you know putting pulling up a motion map, you know mm. that um, that you can use to highlight these areas. But but. Um, you know, in terms of kind of setup for this, again, I, I think, you know, it's really important to remember, too, that these complex fields can pretty easily be handled with the camera because, you mm. know, it's really getting it's really getting everything in the field of view. Yeah, I think the point is, and you mentioned it earlier, every pixel on that screen is a sensor. So every last little, even look at the sugar beet down in the bottom, it, it's motion amplifying the, the product because it's been moved by the the actual strut and yeah it, it, it's just great that i remember one keith had actually um my colleague keith he had a a big crushing mill and it was covered in dust but the he shot the dust and the dust was moving and it, you could tell there was probably a crack underneath the foot so yeah you don't miss a trick with the with the camera so we had a question. I'm gonna let this video play again. We just and we'll get a, we'll get to a question. It says, "How can we differentiate between sources of hot, of one x high vibration using the motion amplification camera?" It's a good question. Mm -hmm. So you get a high one x, right? And and so how how do you differentiate between that? So with the <laughs> with the high one times, what we'd do we'd filter filter into that actual frequency so eliminate everything else and then we're looking at the the motion really is it if it's on a fan is that is it sort of an unbalanced motion have we got uh, a loose bed have we got a flexibility in the bed uh, we may have to look for possible resonance problems and do some extra tests with a camera but my first part of call is really with the one times I can honestly say I would say 80 percent the one times problems I see across industry is down to poor bases, and that mm -hmm. might be a looseness, a flexibility, or a resonance problem. It's there isn't that many now where it's an unbalance or misalignment. Most places are doing good alignment, balancing fans, it, it's bases, and a lot of modern bases are manufactured quite cheaply, so the materials used are a lot thinner. Uh, there's a massive drive for people to go variable speed drives and it just creates a whole host of problems because you've got a, a bed that's very weak to start with, put a VSD on it, ramp it through its speed range and suddenly you're going to hit a resonance. So um, these are yeah. all the one times. So, um, yeah. Yeah, I, you know, I was going to say often, you know, if you're trying to um, be able to see, you know, I, I think lots of times, and that's a good point to make with the camera, Lots of times I think we're, we have this, um, it's kind of a paradigm shift of the way you do thinking. Like we're, we're kind of taught, well, you know, you see a peak, you know, and it's a high one times, but with the camera, you can actually literally see what it is. I mean, yeah. you just see the foot lifting up off the ground yeah. and, 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 and you can confirm and can confirm what it is. You can see the looseness, you can see what's contributing to that motion. So that's yeah. where you can figure out, you know, what's, what, what the cause is. Yeah, I mean, if the, if it's the forces there, say a one times, and it is an unbalance or alignment, what you tend to see on the video is almost like the 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 machine wanting to rip itself off the bed. You actually see the force, the vibration, and there won't be a looseness there, but you'll actually see the metal flexing and deforming, which is quite amazing. I think towards the end, Jeff, haven't we? We've got a good, amazing shot actually of that. Like okay, that. we'll jump to the next. We'll jump to the next one. Yeah. I, I really, I really like this one. It's a very good example. Yeah. So this was a, a good one. Uh, we had a 
client basically said they, they felt it was a brand new machine, steam turbine, uh, HP LP at each end, and they felt that there was some pipe work vibration on the lube oil. And you can see this little center section here, and this is what they felt, and they weren't sure, is it, we don't feel it's right. But they just thought it was there. So what we did, again, you've got to go wide, scan the whole area, and we suddenly found it wasn't just in that area. It was all the way through the turbine onto each end, the HP and LP. And then what we, we do, we apply some criteria, the Energy Institute guidelines, just as a scanning and we can actually put a level against the frequency and see if it's in concern. This was in concern. We then did some bump tests uh, just using um, traditional analyzer. And sure enough, we got some excitation, natural frequencies very close to the generator speed, 25 hertz. Now this, Jeff, this was absolutely key on this job. This is adding some bracing later on. This is in live mode. And Keith there, he's got a temporary base brace and he's, he's, he's tightening it up. So if we just, just play that one back, Jeff, and you'll see yeah. the vibration just die. Um, so I'm, imagine I'm on this job and I'm saying, Keith, tighten it up. And he does that and then boom, we've killed it. We've changed the natural frequency. And it's like having another sense. It, you feel like Superman when you've got that because you, Often, sometimes when you stiffen it, you might put it somewhere else and we could see there we had it. We'd, we'd literally got it in the perfect spot. Um, so it, it did need quite a few braces in different parts. And here's some before and after shots. Uh, but we really reduced the vibration levels down massively. And what's yeah. great with the camera, when you mo motion amplify, if the vibration levels are low in the image, it, it, it's not moving as much like that. That is still amplified, but the yeah. vibrations dropped. So I don't, you don't see it. So that's a key thing for me that what's great with the camera because it's very difficult to make a good machine look bad with the camera, sort of whacking the levels up. Here we go, down to 0.7 of a millimeter per second now on these bits of Yeah, quite, quite a bit difference, right? Yeah, yeah. And it's great, this um, Energy Institute, uh, for scanning for vibrations so it, it's looking at like they've done a lot of research with like cyclic fatigue failures on pipe work and mm -hmm. great as that initial um stab of looking at it so for me live mode there was the real game changer for doing that yeah. because we could assess it there and then um, worked really well yeah. So speaking of which, um, you know, why don't I show, you know, I'll pull up the software and I'll just show where that is, kind of do a, yeah, a little demonstration idea. of that. Yeah. So um, let's see, I'll bring up, I've got a little rotor kit here. Um, it's on a smart switch, so I can actually turn that on um, with my phone. Um, Light work, the live, the live, um... Was a, was a big game changer for us. You could scan lots of areas quickly. Um, yeah, you know, so it, and it's fairly easy to do. I mean, that's one of the things I think everybody should take advantage of when they're using the camera because the amount, you know, how quick it is to be able to do scans. So you set the camera up, you know, you've got it here, you're a few minutes mm -hmm. into kind of setting it up and, and, and turning it on and everything. Um, but it really, it's a click of a button. So if you press this button up here, uh, the live, it goes straight into live and you can increase or decrease your amplification, but you know, that's, that's it. And, and so Stuart was mentioning, you know, they were watching this live, just imagine, you know, they, you know, you put a brace on that and, and you brace it and then the vibration levels go down. And, and if you do want to measure it live, you know, kind of like they, they were mentioning, you can do that too. So if you, you know, you pull up this and you draw a box and I just clicked on this little measurement icon and you can get that, uh, get get that waveform so that's how you can see sort of in real time you know what um yeah. what, what's happening with the uh with the asset really just pretty yeah. simple to do yeah it's a, it's a great tool and we use it a lot for pipe work but to be fair if i go to say i'm scanning a pump it's just it's just there now i'll have a quick look live mode put up the amplification let's see what i'm dealing with what, what what's the problem um yeah, really. I, I like to I like to turn this on immediately too because it's just there's really no extra time added. You put it on 
And, yeah. you know, you can see it and kind of get, kind of come up with a game plan to see what, what, what's what, what's moving. And also yeah. it, it's really quick to, you know, determine, is there any piping or anything around the area that's moving? You know, cause yeah. I know a lot of people who have just picked up, you know, conduit and things that are loose that really should just be done and taken care of. Yeah. And nobody's really yeah. monitoring that stuff. Yeah. It's a lot of the time. It's not just say a, the motor or the pump. It's the instrumentation that's hanging off that might have an issue. We've, we've certainly found a, a few problems with that. But commissioning a new plant and you scan yeah. the network here is really cool. The icon next to it, uh, I don't know what you'd call that, Jeff. Is that the re, restart one? I often, if I'm. If, oh, this I, one here, yeah. Kind of return to live. So. So um, uh, if you if you slow it down, of course, kind of like a slow speed, you know, it keeps taking data, but you yeah. slowed it down. So you're playing it back a tenth of the speed. You sort of go back in time, so to speak, yeah. you know, by a factor of 10. And yeah. you can always press this to get it to kind of go to the current time. Yeah, it's just in, it's instantaneous. So if I just move the camera, I'm scanning there, I just click that right hand button, yeah. and just instantly I'm back back instantly live again so I'll, I'll turn this off i'll turn this off and we can kind of watch it go through its little coast down there yeah so okay cool yeah that's yeah. um that, that's good and i think something anybody should be should be picking up if um if um if if they want to um you know when their camera I always think that you should um should be using the uh the live mode for sure something relevant to what you just did they said if i understand correctly motion amplification is synonymous with with ODS for bump testing. Do you still need a vibe analyzer with impact and hammer and in response with the accelerometer? No, I mean we we've had some. I think we've got one at the end of this. We've had some fantastic results uh, with the with the camera and doing bump tests. And uh, we did some comparisons uh, using a um, tuned hammer, force hammer, and yeah, it it it. it it was really good. We got some great data. And I think I've got an example at the end uh, where we do some bump testing. So Yeah, you know, I think everybody can remember, also remember that you can get full vibration spectrum and waveforms yeah. out, out of it, out of it. So you can actually see, see that yeah. and we'll, we'll show that. Yeah, seeing the full picture with it, that's the thing again. And the, I won't spoil it, but the one at the end is all about when we bumped it. Ah, right. I can see what's, what's actually moving here. Yeah. You know. Okay, we'll jump to the next one then. Yeah, this this I'm, is a. I'm a big fan one. of this case study. Yeah, as you know. Yeah, so. this, this was an early one we had, and it was another light bulb moment of wow, this technology is somewhat special. And uh, we had a pump. This is on a one of our regular jobs, and there's a whole pump alley of these pumps, all similar, and we had a high two times on it. When I say high, it's not ridiculous. I think at times it went up to sort of five millimeters per second. But bear in mind, all the other pumps were like one millimeter per second, um, showing quite high axial as well. Uh, and often with that, we're thinking, let's check alignment, let's check all the holding down bolts. And that's what the guys did. Good set of lads, knew what they're doing. They did it twice over six months. We asked them twice. And every time we cannot, we can't find anything. The alignment's good. Everything's tight. So we got the camera on it. We just sort of quite recently got the camera. And it is subtle, this a bit. This is amplified now. Can you see the motor just rocking uh, front to back sort of vertically? Very subtly, but it's there. You can just see the, the motion. It's not an excessive um, movement, but, it, but it's there. You can see the, the movement. And I'm looking at these videos going, I, I don't get it. And then it the the moment when we put the camera under the rear of the motor and film the actual plate uh, that's on, uh, attached to another plate, and you could see it was sort of bent and flexing like a, a banana. And that was why nobody could find it because you check those bolts, they're gonna be tight, but it's the plate, that's the yeah. steel plate that's the problem. It, and it, you it, know, it, yeah, go ahead, sir. Enough. It's just causing a rocking motion on the yeah. uh, on the pump. And it's subtle, yeah. Yeah. But we, how long did that take? I think we'd done a few external shots, and I think within 10 minutes we'd found that. And we, they'd been on it twice for six months. 
But we yeah. were, I, you know, and what, what I liked about this and I'll kind of play some of this back here, you know, just with the, with where they, where they find it is when you get in here again, the, the, you know, cause the camera can do down to pixel level, you know, it is so easy to miss that if if you didn't have that level of granularity and and then and then also you know the fact that um, you can just put that camera right underneath you know yeah. it, it allows you to go places and see things that that really you couldn't see before and and what in, in terms of approach and and setting things up I you know, I really encourage people to move, you know, the camera mm. to be able to get a really good look at it. Also, I would say that if you notice in a lot of Stuart shots, it, it's kind of like a Where's Waldo. You can see, you can always find one of his his lights in there that where yeah. he's kind of spotted it really nicely. And again, you know, real easy to set, you know, we you you can get these lights, you know, we 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 sell them. There's lots of you know off-the-shelf ones that are you know magnetic and and can kind of really easily placed into kind of darker areas like this and easily get that shot. So that's one of the takeaways that I really encourage people from this is just have that flexibility and use that camera in places that you normally wouldn't traditionally be able to take measurements. Yeah. It's where the connections are. I'm always looking where some, the bolt, where it's bolted to and even concrete don't, don't discount a giant five ton concrete uh, base. Because we've seen those moving as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. When you don't, when you think there's, there's, there's no way that it would happen. Yeah. Okay, so we'll move on to the, to the, um, to the next one here. Yeah, the, another beauty with a camera is flexibility. You can use it for transient problems. So really, like stuff that's not happening all the time. This is a robot, and basically what had happened, uh, they were getting lots of failures, structural failures on the robot, cracks, bear, linear bearing failures. And it all occurred after they added an extra station, this station two. And if we just could we start the video again, Jeff. That's oh, it's it's playing right now. Is it not playing for you? Yeah, no, sorry. I just okay. want to yeah. start back a bit for the oh back a bit. Yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Right yeah, there? Just... Yeah, but, right before that cycle. Yeah. Yeah, before it hits station two. Yeah. A bit more to the left, Jeff. There we go. So you can see this is a two minute acquisition and we're about to hit station two. And you, see, you can see the vibration on the time waveform and the actual robot really shook then when it, it, it lifted the load. So we then focused in on that station two move and you can see the base, it's all moving. And there was a frequency there of 3.6 Hertz, quite low. Here's another angle, station two move, lift, ooh, that. That is all over the shop. Again, you don't need to be a genius. You look at that and say, there's a quarter of a ton of weight that robot's lifting. That base is just not up to the job, basically. They've added some stiffness there, but really they're just flexing. They're just bending uh, the feet. What it really needs is like um, basically a concrete bed, I mean, proper bolting down, um, and that will reduce some of the stress on the uh, actual uh, robot arm and that. So again, again, you can see we're doing different angles and we're seeing these little, mm -hmm. they've added the struts and you can see them, they're just flexing. Yeah. You yeah. can't see that with your eye. You've got, you cannot see that with your eye. So. Yeah, you know, and, and uh, you know, I like this shot here again, just kind of coming back to that, you know, it, it's so easy to connect the dots. Right, you've got yeah. the station, you've got the base, yeah. and you can, and you have the context of what's happening, right? Yeah. Um, you know, whereas you know, you you might not have this, you might not think to look there, but but you know, yeah. and it, and it's high, you know, you've got a, a a region drawn here, right? And but but you have to see the video to know to see that moosh. Say, hey, that's yeah. where I need to be looking. It's yeah, not as if you go into it thinking like I know this base is going to be flexing, right? Yeah. I mean, you can see the ring down on the waveform there as is it, is it got excited and uh, just yeah. down and the whole robot flexes like. So. And, and the thing with these shots, you really need to drop your, um, because it's low frequency, there's no need to shoot at uh, 100 frames per second, yeah. something like this. I mean, what, what have I got there? Is it 20, 25 hertz maybe? Yeah, it looks, looks around 25. So you've collected like 50, 50 <laughs> frames yeah, per second. Had, but to be fair, we could probably go even lower than that. And yeah. 
just reduce the file size a bit. But like I said, that's a two, the whole cycle was two minutes. So it's a two minute acquisition where a lot of the time on a pump or rotating kit, we're probably doing three, five seconds. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, it's a good point because we get a lot of people that look at kilns or slow moving stuff and, and don't, you know, the, the, it's a good takeaway from this to don't be hesitant to drop your frame rate because if you don't need to see above 30 hertz, you don't need to yeah. collect the data. There's no real, real reason to, to do it. No, no, exactly. Yeah, yeah. It just makes the data more manageable as well and everything's... Yeah, just, you know, sure. But yeah. So someone says, could we record the motion amplification of the pump while coast down and assess the critical speeds and resonance? Absolutely, right? Yeah. Totally do that. Yeah, yeah. what's yeah. nice as well, on the when you do that and you do a run down or coast down, and you draw an ROI, a region of interest, and get a, a spectrum. It actually, it's a bit like peak hold. So it holds it across that range. So you literally end up with a graph that pretty much shows you where the uh, not the highest vibration was at what frequency. Yeah. So, um, yeah. But also, if you wanted to pull in the waveform and select a region and just have a spectrum of that, you can do that as well, can't you? But you'll need so many samples to do that. Um, yeah that's possible yeah and you get the full field during that coast yeah. down you see you know you don't have to pick and choose yeah okay so let's hit this other one so yeah this is quite a recent one very interesting uh this is a conveyor drive it's got um big conveyor belt it's got two drives one on the left not a problem you can see it's not moving on this video one on the right they had lots of issues uh cracking on the base literally um, lots of problems. So we actually shot this. This is the uh, video and we can see some significant movement. And I actually found a, a cracked weld. And ama amazingly, um, the guy's got it welded while I was there. This is after it's been welded. Uh, we awesome. can see the motors dipping down on the right hand side. These motion vectors are great, you can see this is almost like, it's like the phase angle, really. What's the phase mm -hmm. angle? Uh, we can see it. This is the left side. Real heavy motion. It's doing about 20 millimeters per second, this. Um, we can see the RSJ flexing a bit here. So like we've done before, we're moving round and we're, we're assessing what's this base like? Is it bolted down good to start with? You see the amplitude change, too, with those vectors across that, across yes. that base. Yeah. That, that bend in the middle there. And, and just the force here is, is flexing. Uh, wow. Is, and it's pretty thing. Now, if we look at that bolt, this isn't the big issue, but it is an issue. You can see just some looseness there. So I think the force of this uh, motor at one, one time has literally sort of pulled that bolt up. So uh -huh. that need addressing. But you can see on the... Uh, the far side now we're around the other side we're going to move in and we're going to look where this motion is and you can see the main rsj is pretty good but when we get close up now to this front foot this is where the welds have been going you can see why they've been going and they're going to go again um because that yeah there's that crack of this base okay so they check the alignment. They'd had two or three motors on there, and they're still getting this vibration. So, the next thing I did, I think, is it the next slide, Jeff? Yeah. Yeah. I just had my my analyzer with me, so I could have done it with the camera, but I was on my own. I was just rushing, uh, trying to get as much data as possible. I did a quick coast down, and sure enough. Uh, as the power was shut off, it runs at 1495. This it got to 1460 and the vibration rocketed. You can see there. So straight away, I'm thinking, right, I think we might be looking at a resonance problem here, excitation. So I've then got in my head at 1460, this is um this is getting excited. So the next thing, I think the next shot, uh this is where the camera really comes in. So I, I could have done with a lot bigger hammer, uh, <laughs> two-ton motor, but this is how good the camera is. Yeah, got so, it, didn't it? Yeah. Yeah, so I've filtered there, filtered the video to 1462. I've whacked the amplification up. That's why the quality is um, a bit grainy. But you can see that whole motor rocking in the same 
manner that we saw when it was running. So this is off yeah. now, totally off. Yeah. Uh, and and I knew then, right, we've got a resonance problem. So what I did, I, I got it here, I bump tested the other motor and I got 1100 mm. uh, CPM and it felt a lot, lot um, heavier, dead, felt a different beast. So we're looking into it at the minute and what we think, this is a, an old motor that's been uh, sort of redesigned. And I'm thinking is the other one a cast one that's a lot heavier and this one's a lighter motor. So what we're gonna do, um, it's not easy just to get these off and weigh them because they're in production. So I've said, let's add 300 kilo of mass. We did some calculations. We're gonna add it to this motor and we're gonna see what the vibration levels do. And because we know that natural frequency is around 1460, adding yeah. the mass will lower it. And as we push it away from the running speed of 1495, I'm expecting that to come down from 20 significant. I'd like to see it down to less than five, to be fair. Um, yeah. If that works successfully, they're doing it right now, to be fair. This is a real live one. <laughs> yeah. um, if that works, great. If not, we might go the other way and actually look at the base, improve it, stiffen it, and send the 1460 natural frequency way above the 1495 and do it that way because if it if it needs four 500 kilo i don't think it will but if it did it starts getting impractical to add that amount of mass on on this uh, machine so that'll dictate which way we go on this example but for yeah. me it, it was great to do that bump test with a camera i saw the whole thing rock because you are thinking what's in residency or what part and when mm -hmm. i got confidence was like right it's I know, I know what it is now so, yeah, yeah 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 but we could have done the rundown as well with a camera we could have done that i just had me analyze it did it but, yeah. yeah yeah makes cool. sense cool let's get to is this a, a oh this is the same one right a hammer don't i jeff i think that? it's got me big i need a bigger hammer yeah you can have to tell. it's got yeah. me big Big rubber hammer. It's like one of these paving slab things because you're trying to excite something weighing over two tons. It's uh, this one's an interesting one because we get a lot of questions about daylight. I mean, that's a different. It's a totally different animal collecting data with a camera as opposed to yeah. being inside a facility as opposed to being outside a facility. Yeah. So, so this is a like great example. Uh, customer asked us to assess quite a large structure, it's a chemical plant. They knew the structures vibrated a bit and they wanted to assess in which direction they were looking at structural loading. And, and if we go back to the original shot, Jeff, mm -hmm. this is a lot for MA users really. Um, because the camera uses light, it really got to understand where, where it works best. And this was a real hot day. This is, was in the afternoon. Uh, this is the raw data, and you can see we've got a lot of shadows. It, because the camera can sort of see the heat, the change in light, you can sort of see heat. So for me, that is the worst time to do this type of job. So what I did, I said to the customer, I said, look, I'll pencil in next week, and I'm going to look for a cloudy day. I'm going to come early morning when the temperature's not heated up all the tarmac. And this different world, look at these shots now, the map, mm -hmm. uh, more It's a very, a very good tip. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So if we play this one, if we look at the, I think the structure at the back, sorry, the next video, Jeff. Next one, yeah. 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 So that was the sunny day where it wasn't great. So this next shot, is it, is it playing all right? Yeah. Yep, it's playing now. Yeah, it's just a bit of a delay. Um, that's the raw data, zero to 12 hertz. Again, I'm shooting low frequency. Structures often are very low. This is 1.4 hertz filtered to it. Look at the big tower at the back. You can see it rocking. We can do a measure yeah. and get a feel. 1.44 hertz, which has actually been excited by an agitator. So we, what we can also do filtered to some different frequencies. This is still the 1.44 Hertz. Look at that. Yeah. Rocking. Look at that. Old structure. 
And this is a big structure. Which yeah. is amazing with a camera, you can see these type of things, but it's all about knowing, getting that frequency. Um, Look at that piping just. Yeah, so this is all over the six place. Hertz now. So this is more like process excitation of the pipe work, different yeah. frequency. We've removed the 1.4 and I filtered a bit of a band, three to six. And wow. we, we were just assessing these cooler pipes, really. So that's what I love about the camera as well. You can just tune in to different frequencies. And while I was doing this job, I actually found a couple of little safety concerns. Here was the pipe. I could tell just off the video there was yeah. it was excessive. It, it needed supporting. And I'm, I think there I'm 80 meters away with a 25. 80 meters away here. Yeah. Yeah. That shot. Yeah. 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 Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Zoom different. Zoom in with the lens. You know, I, I think one of the things I guess um, just just to point out to 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 people with collecting this is just again the granularity of the that you can get with these individual pipes, you know, and being able to to get down and see them. I mean, that is a complicated structure. There's pipe work everywhere. Mm -hmm. Could you imagine trying to go around with an accelerometer trying to assess all that pipe work? In fact, you wouldn't even get to some of it because it's yeah, it is probably not possible. All stories up, isn't it? So, yeah, it's absolutely game changing on uh, stuff like that. Oh, this is a good one. This one, isn't it? I agree. I agree. <laughs> I really do like this one. So this is hot off the press. This and um, Jeff and the guys at RDI have developed this amazing. It's hard to get your head around it. We're still getting his head around it, and it's uh, it's a taxing. So what we're doing is we're putting a piece of reflective tape on a rotating component on a shaft and we're syncing the camera to take a shot every revolution. Boom, boom. That, that, the camera's firing off and we'll take how many cycles shots, Jeff? Maybe 500? Yeah, four, 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 I think four to 800 is, that, is something I usually collect it. Yeah. Yeah. So what you get is this result you'll see it in a minute this resultant video where the shaft has actually been frozen okay so the you don't see it rotating it's now frozen it a bit like a strobe type effect but then then the, this is the thing that just blows my mind we can then motion amplify the shaft okay but jeff do you just want to explain because you'll explain it a lot better than me of what we're actually doing there in terms of like removing the one times compound. Yeah, so it really does with synchronous. It removes the synchronous speed, and what's left is all the non-synchronous. So, so now you don't have the rotation get in the way, and you can actually visualize the shaft just like a vibrating object. And the results are pretty interesting. You know, I, for me, one of the interesting things about this is being able to see things that you've never seen before. You know, yeah, just a I mean, whole new set of applications. Yeah, I mean, um, we. I've seen things in the spectrums of my traditional vibration data that they ain't on no wall chart, they ain't on any training, but they're in there and you think, what is that? What are those sidebands? And this is a great example. So it's a dyno, this. This is a testing uh, dyno. And they were having lots of problems with these bearings on here. You can see there's a flywheel and a couple of bearings. And um, we did traditional vibration analysis with this uh, analyzer. And you can see some of the plots there. And at first, uh, it just looks like, oh, rotating looseness problem. I've got a set of harmonics. But to be fair, the G levels are quite low, so there's not a lot of impact in. Um, anyway, when we went deeper into it, uh, it was more that there was a flexibility in these bearings, basically, which are generating these harmonics up to sort of four or five times. So it's not like an actual loose part that's impacting it's mm -hmm. actually a cocked bearing and it's been distorted but what was amazing and this we're still trying to get his head around it if you look at the spectrum on the bottom left i could again we only saw it in the data uh we could do with a higher resolution plot here but you'll notice there is some sidebands around these peaks more to one side actually uh and these were at 4.1 hertz okay so this is rotating it um 2000 uh rpm what's that in hertz jeff <laughs> <laughs> i don't know 2000 30 I'm odd. Get my calculator 30. yeah a little 30. over 30 yeah yeah okay so we have got a very low frequency on these these sidebands really puzzled 
part of the process of what we're doing, we thought, let's try this taxing technology on it. So we put some tape on, and then if we go to the next shot, uh, this is just unbelievable. So this is in the program, and you basically, you take a video using the taxing, and then you draw your little red box anywhere you want, and you can get a free a spectrum. And sure enough, out pops 4.1 hertz. And we're like, ooh, that is pretty interesting. And, and at this point, we're getting quite excited, thinking, what's this going to play like? So we filter uh, to this frequency, and we use another technique in the software called HDR, which is absolutely awesome. High density recording, really super smooth motion. So I think the next shot, we'll have a look at what, what this was doing. So bear in mind, this is doing 2000 RPM. Yeah, it's turning right now. That's turning, that's turning. I'll just go back to the start again, Jeff, on that one. You can actually see that the, the shaft flexing, the flywheel, there's some axial motion. And you, this is closer to the drive end bearing. This shaft on the left is doing 2000 RPM, but it's frozen. Unbelievable. So the, we think it's a reaction to the poor bearing design that's sort of allowing the, the shaft to do this motion. Yeah, it's uh, just it's bending there. You can see it just, yeah. you know. And it's yeah. thrusting into those bearings. Yeah. That's why these bearings aren't lasting very long. Another shot we did uh, at the back, not it was with the taxing, but it just happened to be, and I, I could see also there was a, a bit of looseness. Uh, one of the sleeves was loose on the shaft. Again, th this end is doing 2,000 RPM, but it's frozen. It's just, it's just mind-boggling uh, to, to see it. So for us, this taxing, uh, it's early days, but we're starting to see some really interesting things that we'd never really see, and you'd, you'd, you'd even think. It's in the data, though, isn't it? It's in the mm -hmm. yeah. standard data, but it's subtle. It's subtly in there. So I think those you'll see sort of torsional things on that. and. Um, yeah, shaft criticals is another one you might see. And so yeah. be, be a flexing. New, new, new sort of bearing defect, you know, kind of ways to look at look at bearing defects. And again, yeah. you know, for this setup, it's a little bit more complicated, and I'll go into it in an advanced feature, but really you use the tack tape and you get the laser tack, similar to how you would put a tack on it now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you do, there's no doubt it is it's a bit more intensive on the job. You've got to get permission to tech guards off and see things rotating but when you've got a serious issue like that it's not often you put a few safety measures in place you, you can get the guards off and you can get looking at this stuff um which is going to get you down to the root cause so this next one we think is a bit of a world first this this one so this is a on another dyno next to it and we, we got a different slightly different we've still got the harmonics but we got a frequency there it's at 4.08 orders and this is actually the outer race uh frequency the ball pass frequency outer race now it's very unusual because it's the first harmonic okay i haven't got the time waveform on there but it was very low g's so it was not impacting a lot it wasn't like I've got a spalled bearing here with massive potholes. It wasn't noisy. There was a vibration at the outer race frequency, first harmonic. I've seen it a couple of times, but it's quite rare. So whenever people think you've always got to use like envelope in or it's always in Gs, not always. You can see some of these bearing faults in velocity. So this was well within the range of the camera. I think I used the MX on this. Is that, I think it's 128 Hertz. Mm -hmm. So that's every second, 128 balls are passing a point on that uh, machine. So it was just crying out to be visualized with the camera. So let's have a look at it. And I'm still sure. trying to get it around this one when we see it. So, <laughs> so this is a filtered to that 128 Hertz. Mm look at the bearing it's it's almost squashing up and down like a tennis ball it's it really flexing unbelievable yeah it really is that's an app that's a bearing frequency we're looking at so the guys there the the pulling the bearing out and we're going to check for two things i think it's i think it's related to the problem on this machine where they're having bearing problems and i think 
the distortion of the bearing is causing the vibration of the outer race ball pass frequency. That's why it's the first harmonic. Now, it may be that there's some wear in there, but it's really even without any potholes impacting. So we're going to inspect the bearing and have a look, but I'm no doubt it's to do with uh, basically a weak bearing design on a real heavy flywheel doing 2,000 RPM, just not yeah. up to these bearings, I think. Uh, but to see it is mm -hmm. that's crazy, crazy stuff. So that's our last case study. I want to I want to just really quickly. We're right at time, so I wanted to really quickly, um, um, you know, um, mention you know before we end that you know we're going to do another one of these. It's going to be next um, next week. I'll be on to go over advanced features. You heard Stuart talk about the tack. Uh, we mentioned motion map. We mentioned filtering. We have a question that says, um, "How do you how do you filter? You know, how do you pick what frequency to filter for?" There's a technique called motion map that we'll be going into that will show you. You can measure anywhere. We'll show those sorts of things. But you know, we'll go in through and talk about you know displacement, time waveform, stabilization, um, how to do annotation. You know, this whole list of shaft inspection and speed detection and phase. Um, you know, we'll have all these available to talk about um, in the in the next webinar. You know, um, in, in, here's the HDR that Stuart talked about, mm -hmm. the live motion amplification. So, you know, lots of features in there that that we'll be going going through. And you know, and I'm happy to talk about those as people the questions come in as well, sort of a on demand um, sort sort of thing, really informal. So. Um, so anyway, I want to hit, hit on that. And um, I think we answered most of the questions. We had a lot of questions. We answered a lot of them along the way. Um, um, but um, what I would say too is um, that we will um, also um, get back with everybody. If we didn't have a chance to answer your questions, um, we'll, we'll, we'll get back with you. Um, we have your contact information. We can, we can get to you directly on this question. So if we didn't get to your question, we will, um, um, be reaching out to answer those. Um, and, um, the, the, um, the last thing I want to point out too, is that, um, Stuart's contact information is, um, here. So if you want to reach out to Stuart directly, their YouTube page is great if you want to kind of check out the videos um, and then our YouTube page as well and con contact information for, from, for, for myself. We like talking about this. Um, so we'd be, be happy to um, uh, discuss if you have any other questions. So with that, I want to, um, you know, thank Stuart for, mm -hmm. for joining us uh, on, on this webinar and thank everybody for taking the time out. We know time's valuable. So we, we really appreciate it.